Morning, everybody. Hope you all had a nice weekend. Okay. Resounding good morning from this side of the that side. So let's try that again. Good morning. Um, yeah, maybe you guys, some of you guys feel like you're in prison right now with these assignments. But maybe we'll play some more Johnny Cash prison music for the next few weeks just to, <laughs> just to inspire you guys. But um, So today we're going to keep talking about file systems. Um, and, and in particular, uh, this, when we start talking about caching and consistency, I think we get to some of the parts about file systems that are, that are pretty interesting and some parts where there's been kind of continued work and research over the last you know, 10, 20 years. So we'll talk about, we're going to start today talking about how we make file systems fast. So we'll talk about how we use memory on the machine, not only as memory, but also as a cache for the file system. So a week ago, somebody came up to me and they said, well, you know, I wonder if I have too much memory in my system. I bought a bunch of memory. Like, I have a, I don't know, I have like 32 gigabytes of memory in my system, so that makes me pretty happy. Um, but they were saying, I, I looked, you know, using my utility and it, it, you know, my system wasn't using most of that memory, so is it going to waste? And I said, well, probably not, because one big thing that operating systems do with memory is cache file system data and make the file system faster, right? So on your system, actually, there's this constant sort of interplay going on between the system trying to decide how much memory to use as memory for process address spaces and paging and things like this, and how much memory to use as part of the file system cache. So even if a large portion of your memory doesn't look like it's used by processes, it's probably actually in use making your disk, your big slow disk, look faster. So we'll talk about that. And once we start about t talking about caching, then we start having to talk about consistency. Because for now, what we've been talking about is file system operations that go to disk immediately. But now, if they're going to stop in memory, then it's possible that the disk is going to be in some sort of interesting state if and when you know, it, uh, the system crashes or the power goes out or whatever. So we'll talk about that. All right. So um, at this point, you know, if you're if you're on my schedule, my recommended uh, daily dose of, of CS41, uh, you should be finishing up assignment two, right? Um, and that will give you about a month for assignment three. Uh, you know, I mean, assignment three is fun, right? Assignment three, I think, is, is the most fun assignment in the class. So I hope that you guys will get there. If you don't get there, you're going to miss out on a huge chunk of points, and you're probably not going to do very well in the class, right? Uh, but the real reason to get to assignment three is because assignment three is fun. Um, and recitations, I think this week, are going to start with assignment three. Right? That's our signal to you that that's where you should be. Right? So if you're still working on assignment two or uh, shutter assignment one, um, you know, you're, you know, you're behind, right? especially if you're working on assignment one. Like that's, you know, that, that's worrisome. So, uh, so that's where, what recitations are going to do for the next couple weeks. And, and I, need to, I need to figure out, I'll, I'll talk to the TAs, we will probably try to continue to hold office hours after lecture ends until the assignment is, assignments are due, right? So there's a couple weeks there, and I'll talk to the course staff and make sure they're okay with this, but I'd like to keep holding office hours. I know you guys, some of you guys will be wrapping up some, you know, just the last few bits of assignment three during that time, so uh, we want to make sure that, that you guys have the support that you need to do that. Um, all right, so any questions on file systems up till this point, right? We're going to do a little bit of a review talking about design goals, the file system operations, how we translate path names, how we find data blocks. Any questions on this stuff before we do a little bit of review? All right, so who remembers what the design goals for our file systems were? We're going to start coming back to these today and we talk about caching. Who can give me one? Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I want performance, right? Uh, all of this I want performance. And today we're going to start talking about how I make some of this fast. Yeah. Efficiency. Yeah, so efficiency defined as what? Yeah, and, and particularly, you know, people have observed that when I think about efficiency, frequently what I'm trying to optimize for is this on the disk, right? That back and forth head seeks, right? Uh, we're going to do a lecture on the Unix fast file system, which is getting older and older. <laughs> Older and cruftier every year, but it's still a fun example of, of how a file system was really, really carefully designed around the specifics of disks. And that'll give you some sense about tricks that file systems have played in the past to try to, again, reduce seat times. Right? Yeah, what's another? Yeah, so not losing data. Right? Some of these other things, you know, you might argue are kind of second order concerns. Right? If you had a file system that regularly lost data, you probably wouldn't care how fast it was because you'd spend a lot of extra time, you know, regenerating the data that it lost, 
right? I mean, think about it. You know, if, 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 you, if you had this great file system and then you had done all this great work working on assignment two and you'd finally got exec to work and then the file system lost all your data, right? Well, yeah, sweet, it was fast, right? But human time is more valuable than file system time, right? So all your lost work would probably make you reconsider your choice of file system at that point. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we want, we want a lot of files to sort of efficiently grow and shrink and stuff like this. I think we have everything, right? So uh, yeah, so tr translating names to contents, right? And we, we talked about how that happens, but we really haven't talked about trying to improve that. Uh, process, right, that happens through, you know, mapping relative path names to inodes and following that trail of inodes, potentially all over the disk, right, which is potentially quite inefficient. Um, we want to allow files to be files, right, so we have this file abstraction, it has some properties file systems need to support, right. Um, we want to optimize access to single files, so we, we talked about at least one trick for doing that. Actually, we talked about a couple of tricks for doing that. What, what is a, what is one one sort of optimization that file systems like ext4 use to try to make accesses to single files fast. Robert? Anybody remember? Sean? OK, we're going to talk about caching today, but what about uh, at the layout level? Yeah, I'm a index table. Okay, well, well, that's just uh, you know that's that's path that's sort of standard path name resolution. What about trying to make access to individual files fast? What does ext4 try to do when it when it creates and allocates individual files? Akshay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, right. So so one thing that that we talked about ext4 doing was allocating file data in big pieces, right? But we're getting closer to the answer, right? Why would I do that, right? Why does that make file system operations fast? Minimize the, uh, movement of the yeah, so, so if I allocate blocks in big chunks, right, it means that all the chunks in that big extent that I've potentially just given to a file are close to each other, right? So when I'm reading data for a single file, I'm not moving around the disk, but what is the other thing that ext4 did? Yeah, remember we, we broke up the disk into these little sort of mini disks, right, these groups, and then we put our inodes, which is the metadata associated with the file, we put those close to the data blocks, right? So we allocate data blocks from the same part of the disk where the inodes are, right? So that's another thing that the ext4 did, right? We haven't really talked about optimizing access to multiple files. This is another file system design goal. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about some of the more advanced file systems. Uh, even FFS started to do this, right? But, but let me, I mean, let's just throw it out there. If, if I knew that there was a set of files that were related to each other, what's one trick that I could use to optimize access to the, that group of files? A group. I know that this group of files is frequently accessed together, right? Meaning kind of at the same time. Jen? Put them close to each other on the disk. Yeah, I could do the same thing I do with data blocks for single files. I just put them close to each other on the disk, right? I put them in the same, you know, FFS has this concept of cylinder groups, right? So I try to put them in a place where the disk can get at them without having to seek the heads too far, right? And then finally, we, you know, somebody mentioned consistency, and that's exactly right. We'll talk a little bit about how we do this today, right? So we want to survive failures. <laughs> and maintain a consistent view of file names and contents, right? So, and again, there were two parts of that, right? One is trying to keep the state of the disk as close to what the state of the disk should be as possible given changes that have gone on, right? And today's the first time we're going to talk about something that directly interferes with that, which is caching. And then the other thing was when a file system crashes, we'd like to be able to recover it to a known good state as fast as possible, and we'll talk about some ways to do that today, right? Those two design goals are not completely the same, right? One goal says try to make the disk as consistent as possible. The second goal says if there is a failure, try to have a process so that when I reboot, I can, I can restore the file system to some known good state. There might be some data loss, right? That might be sort of, you know, especially when we start caching, that might be inevitable, right? But what I want to be able to do is not have problems in the metadata that's in the file, like circular pointers or things that would cause the disk to be expensive to repair. Right. So old file systems you know, had these programs that you could use to check and repair them, but they would frequently take you know, five minutes to run. 
right? And, and maybe even longer, right? On a really badly fragmented disk or in certain cases that could run for really, really long periods of time, right? So imagine you're running a server, you're trying to maintain uptime, you have some sort of crash, the system reboots, so you're like, okay, great, I get my website back up, you know, people can look at more pictures of cute puppies, and then, you know, you wait 20 minutes or 30 minutes while the file system is sitting there uh, reconsistifying itself, right? So that's, that's not what we want, right? All right, so let's talk about what happens when I actually write data to a file. What are the file system operations that have to take place in order for this write to complete? Alyssa, give me one. Yeah, well now a new block of memory, a new block of what? Of disk, yeah. So I need to find disk blocks for this write, right? So I'm going to append to the file. The file's about to get bigger. So I actually need data blocks on disk to associate with this file. What else do I need to do? Peng. I need to actually write the data. Okay, I took the easy one, right? <laughs> there are like three left. Simon. Okay, yeah, so when I started this write, right, or, or when I called open, I would have had to translate the path name. But let's say I already kind of know what the inode number is for the file, right? So what else? Josh? Change the size of the file. Yeah, so and what, what do I have to update in order to change the size of the file? Andrew? I need to update the inode, right? So I need to update the inode. What else do I probably need to update in the inode? I probably need to change the size, and then Tim, what else do I have to do? The last access time, okay, but what, what else? I have these new data blocks, right? What else do I need to change? Sarah? Yeah, I need to associate those data blocks with this file, right? So I need to somehow link them from the inode, so the next time I find that inode, the next time I translate a path, get to this inode, and try to figure out what data blocks are associated with it, I find the ones I'm about to allocate. What else? I think we're almost there. Paul, did I miss anything? Oh, okay. Anybody, Nick? She got yours. Okay, let's see here. So I need to find the empty disk box to use, right? And you should mark them in use, right? So what data structure did uh, ext4 use to track which blocks were in use on disk? I remember this was something that we were able to view some information about using the using the file system debug fs tool. Wembley, do you remember? Mukta? Oh, no, no, no. So I'm talking about ma marking disk boxes in use, right? So that's how I would associate with them with the file, right? I had this sort of like interesting. Yeah, I used the bitmap, right? So in xt 4 I would mark the bits in the bitmap for these data blocks that I've discovered, marking that they're allocated now, right? I need to associate those blocks. We talked about the data structure that allows files to grow efficiently, right? That uses a combination of direct blocks, indirect blocks, doubly indirect blocks, triply indirect blocks, et cetera, right? To, to allow files to get very, very large, right? I need to adjust the size of the file. So this involves making a change to the inode where the file size is potentially stored. And then I actually need to do the write, right? And, and again, from the perspective, this is particularly important we start talking about this today, right? In order for this, in certain cases, in order for this to take place and for the file system to be in a consistent state, all these things need to kind of happen synchronously, right, or, or atomically. All these operations need to take place. If, you know, you can imagine, you can go through here and say, well, let's say I forgot to do this or forgot to do that, and you can think about the types of things that would go wrong in those cases. Right? Um, all right. So let's talk about how we map offsets to data blocks, right? So we talked about three ways of doing this. Who can name one? Yeah. Yeah. So I could have a linked list, right? And you know, we talked about the complexity of, uh, of that. What's another approach? Tao. What's that? Yeah, so I could have a flat array, which is I'm going to interpret that answer, right? And, and we talked about problems with that. Jen, what's, a, what's another approach? Yeah, so I had this, this multi-level index, right, that we, that we finally came to, which is kind of a, a, the, the modern way of doing this, right, where I, I and the, the idea here, right, is I try to have the number of accesses required to get to a data block grow slowly with the size of the file, right? I don't want it to grow with, with the size of the file, which is what it does on a linked list, but I also don't want to allocate a huge amount of space to store a flat array to make it constant time. Right, so I had this, you know, maybe similar to what we did with, with virtual memory, but not quite the same, right? 
All right, any other questions about this before we talk about caching? Now that we've warmed up your own mental caches. All right, so what's our standard operating system trick for making a big, slow thing look fast? What's that? We throw a cache at it, right? So this is kind of interesting because somebody, uh, I, I enjoyed the fact that someone decided to use the Piazza forum for product advice, right? So somebody posted on Piazza about uh, hybrid disks, right? So, so disks, and I, I didn't even know these existed, right? But I guess it makes sense they do, right? Disks that combine uh, a spinning, some sort of spinning medium, right, with flash, okay? So why, why would I use a disk like that? What, what is that disk essentially doing? Or, or what's one way that we could design that disk? Right, I have, you know, I have this big, big disk, right? I'm trying to get the capacity of the big spinning disk, right? Because we talked about how capacity on big spinning magnetic disks is still an order of magnitude cheaper than it is on flash drives. But what am, what am I trying to do, Akshay? Yeah, I mean, one way of designing a hybrid disk, and I don't know if that's actually how they work, is to try to use the, the, the flash drive as a cache, right? The nice thing in this case, right, about the flash drive as opposed to memory as a cache, what's, what's, the, what's the thing that's kind of preferable, potentially, from a file system perspective about flash as a cache? Simon? It's non-volatile, right? So the stuff we're going to talk about today where, you know, again, I pull the plug and the memory loses its contents immediately, right? And so any caching that I've done in memory has potential consistency implications for the disk itself. In flash, it's like, oh, okay, it's still there, right? So that's good. And again, I don't know how those drives work. I'd be interested in finding out, but, but, that's, but that's another, you know, again, we think about the, the hierarchy of storage on your computer, starting with registers at the top, which are like, you know, two cycles to get at, and then with m big, slow spinning disks at the bottom, right? And essentially, a lot of what we do in operating systems is find ways to deal with this hierarchy and figure out where to put things to optimize performance, right? So again, we're going to use the cache, and essentially what we're going to do uh, is we're going to use memory as a cache for the file system, right? So again, until recently when I had this thing called Flash, memory was the you know, uh, smaller, faster thing that was, that was in between sort of uh, you know, higher level processor caches and you know, disk, right? Um, and normally when we, when we talk about the memory that's used to cache file system data, we call that a buffer cache, right? Um, so, so again, on, on, on modern systems, what, what's done, so for example, on Linux, when, when Linux boots, it has you know, a certain amount of memory that's there to manage, right? And now we're going to start talking about a second use of memory, right? Up until this point, the only use of memory we had talked about is for process address space. And what modern systems do that have what's called an integrated you know, uh, memory management and buffer cache is that they allow the memory to be used flexibly either as part of a file system cache or as part of process address space, right? The other way you could imagine doing this is that at boot time, you could essentially take your memory and divide it into two pieces, right? You could say, okay, I've got four gigs on the system, one gig is for the buffer cache, three gigs is, is for my process address spaces, right? The problem with that, of course, is that you've done this static allocation, right? And so if you're running a database server, for example, that might do a lot of file I.O. and be really, really file system heavy, then it might have a large portion of memory that's unallocated for process address spaces that you would love to use for the file system, right? And Linux actually has a parameter that you can feed into the kernel to determine how the kernel makes this balance, right? How much should the kernel prefer to use memory for process address spaces as opposed to for the file system cache, right? But again, at runtime, as your system is, is running, most systems are making this trade-off dynamically, right? So if you start doing big file system workloads, what the system will do is it'll try to find process address spaces that haven't been It'll essentially tell the virtual memory manager, can you trim, right? I want you to trim process pages. I want you to swap them out to disk, right? And I'm going to use that extra memory not for something else for the, for the memory management. I'm going to use it as part of the file system cache, right? Um, all right, so, so again, so I, I use memory as, as memory, and I also use it as a file cache, right? And as you can imagine, these two, these two types of memory use are competitive, right? So the more I use for the cache, the less I have for process address spaces. Um, and, and, and again, if I don't do this trade-off carefully, right, let's say I over-provision for my file system buffer cache, now I may start thrashing, 
right, in my memory system. Because essentially, to the memory system, what it's looking like is I'm running on a machine that doesn't have much memory, right? And, and the danger of doing that is I can crash, right? Um, the opposite problem is that, you know, I can make, if I'm file system bound, right, I can make file system operations very slow by, by giving it a very small cache, right? And, and on Linux, yeah, the parameter I talked about is called swappiness, right? So swappiness kind of tells, it's a cute name, right? It, it tells Linux, you know, how swappy should I be, right? The more, sw what, what does it mean to be more swap? Spencer. Yeah, I mean, it essentially tells the, the memory manager, swap things out harder, right? Swap more, right? Be more swappy, right? Like, find pages to, to evict, right? You're like, run your page replacement algorithms, find pages to evict, and get them out of there, right? And, and essentially what we talk about this is kind of, you think about the system as it's running, right? Processes are trying to use more memory, right? Sometimes we call that memory pressure, right? Like, how much memory is the, is the system trying to use, right? File system, the system is running, it's touching new pieces of code, it's allocating data so that... So the system is trying to use more memory, and then how much sort of downward force is the memory manager placing on that, right? By aggressively finding pages that haven't been used and swapping them out, right? So swappiness, right? Be more swap. Um, so there, and then there, when we start talking, we start talking about the design of the buffer cache. There are some interesting design choices about where the buffer cache should go with respect to the file system itself, right? So. One option is, so, so for example, this is an uh, example of the type of file. So remember, we, when we talked about file systems, we talked about the fact that file systems are more decoupled in most cases, right? Not, not always. This is tr typical on Unix systems, right? But even on, on Windows, right, you might run with multiple file systems, right? You might have, you know, NTFS that's on your main drive. You might have some sort of network file system that's on a different partition. You might have a a flash drive that for some reason still is using FAT32 or whatever. So most file systems provide, uh, most systems provide what's called kind of a virtual file system interface, right? If you guys are doing assignment two, you're getting quite familiar with this, right? So VFS, right? This is what it's called in, in OS161. The idea behind VFS is that, and, and some of you guys have probably scratched your heads and maybe torn a little bit of hair out trying to figure out what happens when I call VOP read, right? Uh, and it turns out that this is one of those cases where we're forcing C to do something that C doesn't like to do very much, right? Which is kind of pretend that, that there, it has object-oriented features, right? Which it doesn't, but we can kind of make it do that by using ugly function pointers. And if you've tried to trace these calls, again, you probably got very frustrated. But what we're tr what, what's actually happening here, right, is that the virtual file system is allowing these calls, right? BFS open, BFS close, and then VOP read and VOP write to map down flexibly to multiple different implementations. So your current system, for example, has a file system that's implemented inside OS 161 that we, you know, if we used to use for an assignment called Assignment 4, which doesn't exist in this particular course. Um, so you guys don't really get any experience using this. And then we also, if you've wondered how you can read and write to files that are actually on your file system, it's because there's a thin thing called MUFS that's an emulated file system that passes the read and write calls that are generated by your kernel down to, down to the Unix file system that your kernel is running on top of, right? Um, but essentially what happens with both of these is that they issue potentially, right? You can imagine if these were sharing the f same file system. And this wouldn't happen on your system, right? Because MU MUFS is using the underlying Unix file system directly, right? But on a real system, what might happen is that you might have mi multiple file systems mounted on the same disk, right, using different partitions of the disk. And so eventually what's happening is these calls start out forking, but what they eventually end up doing is just calling read and write block, right? This is the low-level disk interface. If I have a file system that's mounted on top of a disk, this is what it's eventually doing, right? So you can imagine sitting here at the file system level and watching these calls sort of uh, fan out to different file system implementations. But at the end of the day, what are they going to do? They're going to read and write data blocks. Right? They're going to read and write those data blocks differently depending on which file system they are, and the data blocks will have different structure and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but that's what they're doing at the end of the day. Right? Does this make sense? I mean, low-level disk interface, high-level file system interface, multiple file system implementations. So one approach here is to put the buffer cache below 
the virtual in between. So when we talk about the buffer cache, what we're going to start talking about is a piece of code that intercepts these operations. And instead of allowing them to continue to the underlying file systems, what it does is it reads and writes data from memory. Right? So what, what would happen here is that I would call, and now open and close typically don't necessarily affect the buffer cache directly, but read and write. So when I start reading and writing data, what would happen is rather than actually sending the read call to a file system implementation, what would happen is that the buffer cache would present the contents that were at that point in the file. Right? And, we'll, we'll, and you might wonder, well, how does it get there in the first place? Well, I'll talk about that in a second. Right? But one design approach here is to say, let's put my buffer cache below the virtual file system and have a, handle file system operations on this line. Right? A second approach, which is, I think, more common, is to have the buffer cache below the file system implementations itself and above the disk. Right? So now what happens is the buffer cache is actually reading. So, so the buffer cache here is storing, read in, is storing disk blocks. Right? The buffer cache here has to store some information about actual files. Right? So does this design choice make sense of you? I feel like I've gotten ahead of you. Jeremy. Sure. Yeah, so, okay, so let me be careful here. When we talk about disk caching, right, and, and we talk about the buffer cache, we're talking about operating system level caching of file operations. As, as Jeremy has hinted at, disks themselves do a lot of caching, right? So your disk, like your big slow disk, whether it's a flash drive or whether it's a, a spinning medium, has buffers on it itself, right? And the disk will do things like, if you ask it to read a block, right, It'll read a huge, big chunk of the disk and put it into a memory buffer on the disk, right? And then, hopefully, the next time you ask for a block, it's already got it in its buffer. So there's all sorts of things the disks are doing internally, right, to try to improve uh, I/O. But what we're talking about is stuff that the operating system is doing that will prevent the disk from ever being used, right? So what I want is when I issue a read or write, I want that read or write to actually not even go down to the disk at all, right? The disk never knows. If I've done a read from that block recently, it's in the cache, and so I just serve the result from the cache rather than telling the disk, right? But disks do a fair amount of caching, and that can really, really affect disk performance, right? So one of the things you can look for when you buy a disk is like how much internal caching is it doing, right? And, and how good is it? And actually, I have no idea how disks do that, right? I could make some guesses, right? And so could you probably by the time you're done with this class, but, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the operating system level caching. Any other questions? This is a good question. Yeah, actually. On the disk, yeah, I mean, it's pro it's pro I mean, at some point, what I'm guessing is that the disk caches, as you increase size, they probably start to, to write, lose performance, right? Because part of it did doing disk caching is trying to predict what blocks are going to be used next, right? And what we'll see is that as we, as you would imagine, right, as I get higher and higher in the system, right, closer and closer to the application, the likelihood of knowing what disk block is going to be used next gets higher, right? The hardware doesn't necessarily have much visibility in what's going on, right? The hardware sees read from block 512, read from block 513. It doesn't know that block 512 contains some inodes and block 513 contains some data, right? All it knows is that, oh, well, okay, I got to read from that box, and maybe I'll get some data that's close by, right? So, so as you get down closer to the disk, and this is actually one of the challenges with this design decision, right? So you can imagine up here I have more visibility into the semantics of file operations, right? So if I get a read from a certain offset, I know where the read came from, and I know actually what's happening. Right down here, all I see are these reads. All I see are blocks. Right, I see again, you know, read from block 513, read from block 514, and so some of this information is lost. Right, and this is essentially, this is essentially what what drives the design decision here. So above the file system, what I would cache in my buffer cache are entire files and directories. Right, so. Uh, and the interface to the buffer cache is the same as the interface to the virtual file system, right? It, it's these file system system calls that you're pretty familiar with, right, by now because you've been exposing them to applications through the system call um, So, you know, we could talk about if I put my cache uh, up here, what, what do I need to do in certain cases, right? So, again, what I'm going to cache here is entire files and directories, right? And, and we'll talk in a second about why that is. Um, the buffer cache interface is the same as the virtual file system interface. So, so let's talk about how these calls would work with the buffer cache that's, that's at the file system level. 
Right? So when a process calls open, for example, this, the buffer cache doesn't, you know, the buffer cache has no information about the file at this point, right? So what I need to do is I actually need to pass that open call down to the file system implementation that we're normally used, right? What about if it, what about if a read occurs? How do I handle a read, right? So this is a cache. I get a request to read some data from a particular file. What do I want to happen? Well, I want it to be in the cache, right? What I want to say is, hey, I've got that data from this file lying around in memory, right? I've allocated some memory for it, and I've already read that data, but how does data get into the cache? Navi. Yeah, it's got to come from the disk at some point, right? There's no way to get into the cache unless I actually allow the file system to perform the operation. So what happens the first time I do a read from a file? Sarah. Yeah, so basically what I need to do is just allow the read call to proceed, right? I pass it down to the underlying implementation, and then what's going to come up? Right? So I, I tell the file system to do a read, and, and, and what's returned by the file system? Not a trick question. What, what's that? The data, right? And so remember, I need to be on both paths. So, I, so, so as the data come back up, blah, blah, as the data come, come backs up, um, where, what do I do with it? Right? I put it in my cache. Right? So I say, OK, there was a read from this file. Now I load the, the data into my cache. Right? Now let's say there's another read from this file. What do I do now? Greg. I know, too bad. <laughs> uh, so now, now after I've done one read from the file, what do I do, what do I hope happens in the future when there's future reads from the file? Where would I like to serve them from? Yeah. From the cache, right? If the file's in the cache, I just return the cache contents, right? What about writes? What about writes to the file? I get a write to a file. What do I need to do? Amit. Yeah, so, so the first thing I have to do is, if the file's not in my cache, right, I need to, um, I need to potentially, if I'm not going to actually cache that data, I need to pass the, the write down to the underlying file system, right? Uh, what if the file's in my cache? Yeah, I just, it, I just modified in the cache, right? So, so let's go back to our observation, right? That caching is opposed, directly opposed to consistency. Why? Right? We've got to the point here where this should become, become apparent to people. Sam, what problem does this create? Well, but no, let's, let's just say the writes and reads uh, proceed completely naturally. Jen. Right, so that's exactly right. So if, if what I'm doing is only ever updating contents in the cache during writes, right, then as Jen pointed out, the cache is, the, the disk contents are stale, right? The disk contents haven't been updated in a file, right? The file if you've been you know, writing all these changes to you know, exec.c, and the changes aren't on disk, right? The changes are, are stuck in the cache. And so if the system dies or if my operating system crashes, then the cache data is lost, and the disk is now in an inconsistent state, right? Actually, the disk that may, may not be inconsistent. The disk is just wrong, right? The disk has the version of the file that you, know, uh, you, you were editing an, an hour, right? And we'll talk about how to, how to address this. What do I do when I, when I close a file, potentially? This goes back to our observation about why I might want to have open and close. Submit. Yeah, I need, to, I need to pass it down to the file system. And potentially, what should I do, right? I should probably take the contents of my cache. Let's say I haven't told the file system about any of the writes that have taken place, right? Now would be a good time, right? Like the file is closed frequently. So many people have ever called flush? Right, on a file handle, right? Uh, in, in, in C or sync, 
right, or any of these operations, right? Well, one, one of the things that Flush does is it actually tells the cache, you know, send this content to disk, right? If you've been holding this content in memory somewhere, actually, please write it to the disk now, because I would like that, right? Uh, Jeremy. Can you call that code in a while everything is flushed, or does it allow other things to I mean, it's a good question, right? I, I mean, I suppose it might block the process that called closed, but it pro I mean, it will probably try not to block other things. Right. And the whole system isn't going to stop. I have some IOs I need to finish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we'll talk about this, right? So, so this is the question. This is particularly problematic with writes, right? So remember, reads, so do reads create any consistency, any of this sort of staleness problem, right? No, right? I mean, on, on some level, reads are, are, are completely free, right? Because they don't change the content of the disk. So I can cache reads as hard as possible. Right? Like I can be as aggressive as possible as caching reads. I never need to worry about, about consistency, right? because they don't change the disk. Right? And then we have writes, on the other hand, I, I need to be, be careful about what I do. We'll talk about some different approaches to, to caching writes, or not caching writes, right? depending on, on what I put. Right? So if I put my cache above the file system, what are some advantages or disadvantages of this approach? Yeah. Well, okay, so, so I'm assuming that it's going to be fast regardless, right? Like, either one of these approaches, I mean, it's too bad you guys don't have to do assignment four. I'm sure you guys don't feel that way, right? But, because um, one of the parts of assignment four used to be implementing a buffer cache. And it was one of those things that when you do it, it's actually pretty shocking how much of a performance improvement the buffer cache provides, right? Like, you guys aren't used to this on your system because your systems do nice caching already, right? But when you ran SFS on a bare disk and then you implemented a buffer cache, it was like, whoa, right? I mean, it's a real huge importance proof. So this is going to make a meaningful performance impact, right? But what's a nice thing about doing it up here? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, so I, I, I have more sort of understanding of what's happening, right? I see files and offsets, right? Which is nice, right? Because I might say, hey, you know, if, if I've, I've seen a read for this certain uh, offset into a file, maybe I should, should actually get some other disk blocks in that file as well to pull them into the cache preemptively, right? We had this idea of trying to do sort of read ahead for certain types of files. So this is a good question. So I, I see information about files, right? I see the semantic information. What do I not see? What can this type of cache never cache? So you think about it, right? I did a I did a read operation, right? And that read operation was I and, and I only saw all I see when I do a read at this level is I see the read operation going down to the file system and I see the contents coming back up. What do I miss, right? What happens at the disk level that I'm never going to be able to catch? Paul. Yeah, I never see any operations to disk structures, right? Because those don't get those aren't, those aren't part of the content, right? The inode doesn't come back with the contents. All the the inodes and all the on disk data structures, the bitmaps, the super blocks, all that stuff is only used to perform these file system operations. So it's used sort of below the um, it's used below my visibility, and so I don't see those, right? And we talked about before, right? Those parts of the of the disk get used a lot. Right? Like the super block is used all the time, right? The inodes get used very, very regularly. And you know, many, many different file operations have to touch those metadata structures. So this is a potentially a big, a big problem, right? Um, the other, so this is this, and then the other thing that happens is I, I hide a lot of file operations from the file system, right? And, and this is so these two things kind of together essentially make this approach, I think, kind of a, a, a loser, right? Despite the fact that I do see these file operations, right? The problem is that, for example, um, you know, if, if I'm caching a file operation, it never actually is passed to the file system. The file system actually has no idea it ever happened, right? You know, so if I if I manage to cache a write, then the file system doesn't even see it. So the file system may want to update some of its own internal structures, right? In some of these cases, right? And I'm preventing it from doing that because it never sees. Sean, did you have a question or? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I certainly have to do some careful sort of syn synchronization, right? I mean, the file system buffer cache, regardless of where it's placed, is a shared data structure, right? That's going to be accessed by every, you know, by multiple threads running in the kernel and a bunch of different processes concurrently, right? However, what, what, I mean, at least on Unix, right, and hopefully you guys have been thinking about this as part of assignment two, what, what sort of semantics, what sort of enforcement guarantees or, or thing does, does Unix provide to multiple applications that have opened the same file independently? What's that? If I open a file, if my process open a file, they, they, these processes are not related, right? There is a special case here that you guys are working on. But if two processes open a file independently and start reading and writing it to it, is there is there any consistency guarantees that are provided by the file system or by the system? Well, I'm not talking. So I'm not talking about the the VFS structures, right? What I'm talking about is so 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 here's the scenario, right? Two processes concurrently call. They open the file and then they call read, you know. Uh, you know, or, or what, uh, let's put it this way. At the same time, right, or overlapping, one of them calls read 256 blocks and the other one calls write, right? Are there any guarantees as to how those are going to work out, right? Will the read see the data that was written by the write call or not? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, in this particular case, right, there aren't really any, any guarantees provided by the system, right? It, you know, and it really depends on kind of who wins. Right? Like, did the read happen first or did the write happen first? Right? And if processes don't coordinate this properly, then, then they're, they, you know, they're going to end up sort of reading garbage. Right? So in general, trying to use files to do IPC is difficult. Right? And that's why uh, we provide other IPC mechanisms. All right, so, but that's a, that's a good question. Right? So, so again, and th these two things together essentially kind of make this, make this, uh, make, make this a loser. Right? All right, so let's talk about our other alternative, which is putting the cache below the file system. So if I position the cache below the file system, I wish I had another copy of that nice diagram, what, what is the cache actually caching? Right? So above the file system, I was caching files and directories. Right? That's what I saw operations on. Right? Below the file system, what do I see operations on? So what needs to be in the cache? Yeah. What are the file like? What are the file systems operating on? Right, the file systems see these calls, and eventually, what do they do? What's the low-level interface that they're using? Where do I need to do my caching? Probably. Yeah, I cache disk blocks, right? Just whatever the disk block size is. And again, you know, on ext4 we said it's 4K, so that's nice, right? One page per disk block. You know, in general, the disk blocks are probably going to be some either multiple or divisible divisor of a 4K page, so this is nice, I don't have any fragmentation, right? So I have a system that essentially caches disk blocks, right? What's the interface to the buffer cache? Josh? Yeah, re well, read and write what? Yeah, read block and write block, right? So it's, you know, what I'm doing is I'm intercepting the low level uh, calls that are being issued by by the, the file systems themselves, right? Remember, file systems get a call, read, write, open, close, and what actually happens, right? The file system implementation translates that call by using a series of low-level disk operations, right? Write block, read block, right? That's, a, that's essentially how file systems work. That's the two operations they, they have, right? There might be one or two more that they can call on the disk, but essentially, the way they keep the data and their data structures on disk up to date is by calling read and write block, right? Um, so, so again, so let's talk about this approach. What are, what's the nice thing, and, and these are, this is kind of the remembering what was on the slide five minutes ago question, right? So, because these are pretty similar to the pros and cons for the other approach. So, Hui Kyung, what's a pro to caching file blocks? File systems, disk blocks, sorry. What's that? Okay. Not sure I like that answer. Let's try s I think you're you're getting close. Yeah. Paul. Yeah, I mean remember, anything the file system anything the file system uses is a disk block, right? I can cache anything that goes to disk, right? I can cache inodes, I can cache the super block, I can cache on disk data structures like the block bitmaps and everything, I can cache all this stuff, 
right? Which is awesome, right? So now there is nothing that the file systems use on disk that I can't put in the cache, right? So that's a big plus, right? Um, what's another pro to this approach? What, what was another one of the problems with the, with the previous approach? So what's true here, right? In the previous approach, reads and writes or other file system operations on it. Yeah, OK, so that would say that's probably a, yeah, OK, so that might be a con if you're putting that in the con category. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, but, wh but why, right? So b before what would happen is sometimes the blank would not see the blank. Uh, we'll see all the file operations. Well, we'll see all the file operations. Well, okay, it, it probably will, right? But who else will see all the file operations? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay, I'll accept that answer. The the file systems are going to see all the file operations. Anytime you call read or write, the file system will know. Right? So if the file system wants to implement consistency semantics right, of its own, and we're going to talk about how file systems keep data consistent. Right? But part of the requirement for keeping data consistent in the file system is that they see all the file operations, even if they're cached. Right? Even if a write or a read hits the cache, there are many cases where in order to keep uh, state up to date, the file system should still know that the write happened. Right? With my cache above the file system, sometimes the file system didn't even know the write happened because it hit the cache and the cache never pulled. Right? So in this case, all the file operations are seen by the file system. Right? And this, is, this is pretty important. When you think about this when we come back to talking about journaling and other things that file systems do to, to maintain consistency. Right? So somebody pointed out one con, which is that I, I don't see, it's more difficult to see semantics of, of files and file relationships. Right? I, you know, the, the cache itself you know, may not, uh, know that these two disk blocks, or, or it may, if I tell you here's a disk block to put in the cache, right? The cache can't necessarily say, well, okay, you asked for offset zero in the file. I'm going to pull everything from offset zero to offset 1024 into my cache, right? Because all it sees is the disk block. It has no idea if that disk block. So, so again, because I see all these on disk data structures, I also might not know what those data structures are. Right. So I see a block. Is it an inode? Is it part of the super block? Is it part of some sort of other on disk data structure? Is it a data block? And even if it is a data block, is it close to anything else? Right. Are there other data blocks nearby? So what's, what's one thing about, somebody pointed out something about ext4 extents before. So what's one way that ext4 extents or other types of strategies by file systems to put blocks close to each other might help here? What is it? So when ext4 create space for files, we talked about how it doesn't allocate one block at a time. It takes a big chunk of blocks and associates them with the file, right? We, we causes some data, it causes some internal fragmentation, right? Because it's not guaranteed that all of that extent will be used. But what's one impact it might have on caching? Dan. No clue. So I just said that the file, the cache can't necessarily make assumptions about locality of, of disk blocks, right? So I see a, a read for block 510. I don't necessarily know what that is. Are we going to say blocks in the cache Yeah, so, so in this case, what might happen is I might be able to make those assumptions, right? Because if most of my data blocks are located close to other data blocks in the same file, right? then the cache might be able to actually do more aggressive caching, right? So if it sees a read to block five, or a read from block 512, it might say, give me all the blocks close to 512, right? I'll load them all into the cache because the likelihood is that they're related to each other in some way, right? The, and, and extents make this more likely, right? Because extents mean that there are big chunks of blocks on disk that are related to each other, right? And, and again, this is what modern operating systems do, right? We have a, a, a block, a disk block buffer cache. Yeah. No, I think it's I think it's really because caching above the file system it particularly interferes with consistency, right? And there are, there are ways to work around that, right? But but the and and the other big win here is I can cache metadata, right? Like that's really important. Now, 
Now, when I start talking about metadata like, data, like the inodes and superblocks, the caching semantics of that metadata might be different, right? So, for example, a file system might say, whenever there's a write to an inode, right, or to the superblock or to an on disk data structure, flush that write to disk immediately, right? So, it will never allow writes to stick in the cache because, you know, it's one thing, you know, as Jen pointed out before, okay, maybe the file contents haven't been updated for a few minutes as I've been editing the file. That might be okay, right? If the file system dies, then you get a slightly older version of the file, okay, right? But when I start talking about metadata operations that affect these critical file system data structures, then if those don't get to disk immediately, I might boot up and I can't, I can't parse the file system at all. Right? My data structures for the file system are broken, and I might have to spend a lot of time repairing things. So, all right. So we talked before, I'll just end here today, and on, on, uh, on Wednesday we'll talk about consi consistency, right? So we talked before about the fact that um, objects in the cast are lost, blah, blah, objects, right? Dirty cache blocks, right? Anything in the cache that hasn't been synced to disk are gone when the system fails, right? When the system fails, what you have left is what's on disk, what's gone is the cache. And so, um, and, and again, remember that every file system operation involves modifying these multiple disk blocks, right? You know, updating the inodes, you know, changing various on disk data structures like these bitmaps, right? Actually writing the data blocks, associating the data blocks with the file, right? Um, so all of these different things have to happen. And again, I'll just leave you with this to think about, you know, all, if, if, if any of these get stuck in the cache and don't get to disk, right? I mean, this can, this can already happen, right? This could happen even if you flushed them immediately if the file system died like between steps two or three, right? What caching makes worse, right, is that the potential for these, the longer things stay in the cache, the longer you have to unplug the machine and create some sort of problem on the disk, right? The shorter things stay in the cache, the shorter your window is for creating some sort of, some sort of ugly problem, right? So, and again, this is directly, directly affects performance, right? Because for performance, I want things in the cache as long as possible, right? The idea behind caching things, right? So why do I cache writes? Let's say there's a write to a disk block. Why not just write it to the disk right away? What's, what, what, am, I, what am I hoping will happen? Um, well, writing is slow, but so what? I'm going to have to write it at some point, right? What am I hoping will happen in the cache before I have to write it to disk? Yeah. For well, okay, reads, but what else could happen that would be even better? Paul. No, I'm just thinking about standard cache semantics, right? I have a write, I have a written it to disk, why not? Actually. Yeah, there's another write, right? So I said, okay, I've got, remember, I've got several different operations to make into the inode, right? So if I write the inode here, I've done one write, then I've got to write the, then I've got to associate the data blocks, now I've done another write, right? Then maybe later I'm going to update the modify time, now I've done three writes, right? If those writes stay in the cache, then hopefully I can take those three writes and amortize them into one write, right? But again, the longer I wait, the more writes I can combine. The shorter I wait, the more likely it is that the file system is, is consistent when there's a failure. And we'll talk about ways to work around this on Wednesday. I will right, we'll see you guys then.